there were uh, <clears throat> many laws that were passed uh, regarding slaves that eventually would become known as black codes. And one of them was that, that it was illegal to educate slaves. It was, a, it was a, a law that was punishable by heavy fines or even jail time. Uh, you know, here's, here's the, the reason why that was, you know, uh, education with education brings enlightenment. Um, you begin to really reflect on yourself and your situation. Um, you'll understand that when you go off to college and uh, you start learning more things and you start questioning a lot of things. And, you know, with education comes more questioning and learning about where you are. So the last thing that slave owners wanted were for slaves to learn how to read and write and really learn about their horrible situation. So it was forbidden for uh, slave owners to even educate their slaves. Now, many of them allowed slaves to be educated. They even educated them themselves, uh, but most of them did not. Most slaves that could uh, read or write taught themselves how to read and write. Uh, even when it came to retaliation or slave revolts, there were few and far between. One of the most amazing things, and I've talked about it in this chapter, is that there were very few slave revolts that, that were bigger than like Shays Rebellion. Um, you know, they're, they're, they just didn't happen. Slaves were uh, afraid to revolt. There were scare tactics that were used to keep slaves from revolting. Like for instance, if a slave ran away, then if an owner wanted to make a point, um, make an example out of that slave, that then they may amputate a foot or a leg, um, although that was rare because slaves were expensive. If they felt that there was gonna be a, a potential uh, situation where many slaves were gonna escape, then they might do that to um, save, save them uh, from having that, that uh, happen where slaves would, would, would uh, leave the plantation. So, but when it came to getting their point across, slaves would do things like breaking of tools or stealing of food. That was the most common things that they did were, were mass slowdowns, just trying to slow down and, and not pick as much. And then if everybody was on the same page doing that, then may, they may able, be able to get their point across. It would hurt the owner of, of the plantation financially, and that's when they can get their point across. So there were things that they, they could do. Uh, generally speaking, though, slaves were, were very manageable in history. There are, there are some exceptions, and probably the most well-known exception um, when it came to slave revolts was Nat Turner, uh, who was from Virginia, and he led a rebellion. Uh, he believed that he was uh, sent by God to free the slaves, and um, you know, he, he, his goal was to, to try to kill as many people as he could, white people as he could, and get the slaves to, to rise up. Uh, and all about 50 white people were killed. Um, there was uh, obviously panic amongst white people in Virginia about uh, what happened with Nat Turner. Uh, but here, Turner, it says here that Turner had hoped that his actions would cause a massive slave, slave uprising, but only 75 joined in, in his rebellion. So more evidence that it was very difficult for these slaves to come together and coordinate slave revolts. Over 3,000 members of the state militia were sent to deal with Turner and his gang, uh, and, and they were able to defeat and find uh, Turner. Um, Nat Turner was executed on November 11, 1831. Some uh, early abolitionists. So the theme of this chapter is you know, abolition, and it's one of the biggest reform movements that came out of the spirit of the Second Great Awakening. It is the biggest abolition. Uh, the Quakers, the first to ever come out against the practice of slavery, were Quakers in the colonial times. And then you have things like we're going to discuss the American Colonization Society and some other individuals that uh, were uh, well-known abolitionists. But let's first talk about this interesting um, attempt to free slaves slowly over time. The year was 1817, and there was a group called the American Colonization Society that, that came about, and their plan was to buy a piece of land in Africa, 
and, uh, and, and have that as a landing spot for slaves. And they would go to slave owners and the slave owners would voluntarily send them slaves and then they would ship them over to Africa to get them out of America. The people who were involved in the American Colonization Society were a mixture of people who were who humanitarians who thought slavery was wrong and we should send slaves back to Africa and also people who were prejudiced who said, let's end slavery because financially it's not the best thing and then let's ship slaves off and get them out. And there it was it was driven, they were driven by racial prejudice. Uh, but it was, the goal was gradually freeing slaves over time and sending them to this piece of property that was purchased by uh, the United States in Africa. They went through with the purchase. The area is called Liberia. It's called, the country is Liberia today. The capital is Monrovia after President James Monroe, who arranged for the purchase of Liberia. Uh, we no longer own it, uh, but we did at this time. The problem with another problem with the American Colonization Society plan of, of slowly sending slaves over to Africa is that most slaves wanted to be free, but they didn't want to go back to Africa. It was a foreign country to them. Their families were here in America and they wanted to stay. The number one goal of the majority of slaves, if they were to be free, was to go find lost loved ones that got sold off kids, aunts, uncles, cousins that got sold off and were sent to other plantations. Their number one goal was not to go back to Africa where they may have had ancestors that came from, but they didn't come from. So the, the American Colonization Society failed. Uh, it didn't go over well and, and the property was given up. Theodore Dwight Weld was another well-known abolitionist who he wrote an influential book called American Slavery as it is which was um, uh, a collection of essays uh, uh, that were generated from interviewing people who were actually saw and were part of slavery it was a collection of personal accounts and newspaper reports documenting slave life in the south um, and it was uh, his wife Angelina Grimke who was another well-known abolitionist she was from the south but moved to the north um, Harriet Tubman would credit the American slavery as it is as inspiration for her work which uh, in the writing of the book called Uncle Tom's Cabin that we'll discuss in the next chapter but Uncle Tom's Cabin is arguably you know one of the most important books ever in world history helping bring on the Civil War and helping win the Civil War for the North uh, we'll talk more about that as we go but you'd have to say that the Bible was the number one most influential book in world history. But then I think, you know, when you look at the second most important book, Uncle Tom's Cabin has to, has to be there. Uh, Lewis uh, Tappan and his brother Arthur started um, in the Anti-Slavery Society in New York, and they would hire speakers to come and talk about, uh, about abolition, about slavery, um, and they were very, very influential in changing people's minds about slavery. And uh, he also arranged for the uh, defense of Joseph Sinkew, who uh, was a slave who led a slave revolt on a slave ship called the Amistad. The slaves overtook the ship, killed the, uh, the crew, and sailed into America where they were rejected. Um, but he was up for murder and and the trial, this went to trial and uh, Joseph Sinkey got off on the charges, but the slaves that were on that ship were not allowed to stay in America. But, uh, and then they tried in Cuba and eventually were sent back to Africa. There is a, there is a, a, a movie out that was you know, early nineties. It's called Amistad. Pretty good movie. I highly recommend it. Here's some information here about, about that. It says here in the trial before the Supreme Court, the Africans were represented by former U.S. President John Quincy Adams. The 73-year-old Adams passionately and eloquently defended the Africans' right to freedom on both legal and moral grounds, referring to treaties prohibited the slave trade and the Declaration of Independence. The Supreme Court decided in favor of the Africans, stating that they were free individuals, kidnapped and transported illegally. They had never been slaves. Senior Justice Joseph Story wrote and read the decision. It was the ultimate right of all human beings in extreme cases to resist oppression and to apply force against ruinous injustice. The opinion asserted the Africans' right to resist unlawful slavery. The court ordered the immediate release of the Amistad Africans. 
35 of the survivors were returned to their homeland um, and the others died at sea or in prison while awaiting trial. So pretty sad ending to that story. Some radical abolitionists that we'll talk about here, the first one being William Lloyd Garrison, very radical. Um, he was the editor of an anti-slavery newspaper called The Liberator. Very, very well known was William Lloyd Garrison. He also supported women's rights um, and also was a, uh, attendant, uh, she, he attendee of the Seneca Falls Convention. He was stern, he was uncompromising, and he, his thing was the outright uncompensated end to slavery, the immediate and outright uncompensated end to slavery. He wanted slaves to be released, obviously right now, immediately, and uncompensated meaning slave owners would not get paid for the, the loss of their slaves, which was an idea that was being floated around that slaves could be freed, but slave owners would be compensated for that loss by the United States government. William Lloyd Garrison said that should not happen. He even proposed that the North secede from the South if slavery did not end. Um, obviously, we know it's going to be the other way around, but he, he proposed that. And he publicly burned a copy of the Constitution in protest to slavery, which was very controversial at the time. Here is a, uh, a quote from the Liberator, and it's a quote attributed to William Lloyd Garrison. He said, I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hand of a ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her baby from the fire into which it has fallen. But urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch and I will be heard. Garrison's strong words on free, freeing slaves. Wendell Phillips, also a well-known radical abolitionist who was a great speaker. Um, he went on and went and spoke in places like Boston and New York. Um, and he was also an advocate of, of women's rights. He was a converted, uh, he converted to the abolitionist of slavery, slave, abolition of slavery when he heard William Lloyd Garrison speak uh, at the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society in 1835. Uh, he was particularly impressed by the bravery of these people, and during the meeting, a white mob attempted to lynch Garrison. Phillips was so outraged by what he saw that he decided to give up law and devote himself to obtaining freedom for all slaves, and became one of the greatest speakers in American history in regard to abolition. Another radical abolitionist, uh, a man by the name of David Walker, who wrote an appeal to the colored citizens of the world. He was uh, uh, very radical and advocated for a bloody end to white supremacy and a bloody end to slavery. He said, you know, um, if we can't do it peacefully, do it violently. Another well-known, uh, probably uh, one of the most well-known African-American abolitionist was Frederick Douglass, who was actually a runaway slave. He wrote a book. It's an it's a autobiography. It's called The Narrative and the Life of Frederick, of Frederick Douglass. He was uh, very practical. Uh, he was another great speaker. People would, mobs of people would uh, go to his speeches to hear, hear what he had to say about slavery. Um, and uh, eventually he was forced to move to Africa because of the fugitive slave law that we'll be talking about. Everybody knew that he was a runaway slave and what the fugitive slave law meant that if you knew of a runaway slave, you, it was your duty to turn that runaway slave in. And if you did not, you'd be, it, uh, you could be punished by being put in jail or being fined. So anybody who knew anything about Frederick Douglass would have to turn him in and he would go publicly speak about his time as a slave. So he left the country so as not to get people in trouble. He later came back. The South um, was always trying to protect their slavery, the slavery, their slaves and slavery. And one thing that bonded all Southern states together was slavery. They all had slaves. They protected it with everything they had. Um, they were against things that would have benefited them financially, like going against internal improvements. Um, an example would be when Madison uh, repealed or he vetoed the internal improvements bill from the American system in 1816 because he felt that 
if the federal government could give them money, the federal government could also take their slaves away. Um, so anyways, everything, they, they, they were just, um, they put blinders on, Southerners did. They, they would try to justify slavery in calling it a necessary evil or a national benefit. They'd take the paternalistic view that the slave, own, slave owners were like the fathers of the slaves and the slave was like the child and what would the child do without the uh, father there to guide them. They'd use the Bible they oftentimes find quotes in the Bible and they justify slavery or they'd use science to justify slavery. It was nonsense from sensible people. How can, how can an entire, you know, section of the country believe this nonsense? Um, and it's just unbelievable that it, that it happened. In Congress, uh, they, so, so much of the daily business was being taken up by anti-slavery petitions because abolitionists would, would filibuster. They'd come and they'd talk about uh, one bill after another about outlawing slavery. Uh, and this was happening on an everyday basis all the time. So much so that not very much work could get done in Congress. So they passed a bill called the gag resolution. And it was in effect for nine years. For nine years, you couldn't bring any anti-slavery bills to the table um, because of the gag resolution. And it was a big blow to abolitionists. And it wasn't until nine years later when uh, John Quincy Adams uh, was able to get this repealed. Uh, that was a, a blow to slave, slave owners. So now they were able to talk about anti-slavery petitions. But just goes to show you how much power the South had. I mean, the South pushed for the gag resolution and it passed. And they couldn't talk about anti-slavery stuff for nine years. The South is eventually going to pay the price, no doubt. I mean, they're going to lose the Civil War, the lack of diversification of their economy. They're a one-crop economy. Just talk to Ireland about having a one-crop economy where, you know, it was only the potato. And when the potato, you know, went bad, their whole country went bad. The South is going to go, you know, the uh, Civil War is going to hit and they have one crop only and that's cotton and that's not going to be able to produce. And they're going to be down and out for 20 years after the Civil War. So they had no immigrants down there because no immigrant wanted to come to the South and compete with slave labor. They have no factories down there because it was only, everything was taken up by cotton fields. The stagnation of a economy and the heavy uh, dependence on the North is going to de doom, sorry, going to doom the South for a very long time. And the last thing that we're going to talk about is uh, another well-known abolitionist uh, who, who became um, a martyr for the cause, meaning he died for the cause. And the, and the man's name was Elijah Parrish Lovejoy. He started a religious newspaper called the St. Louis Observer in Missouri. He advocated for the abolition of slavery. In 1836, Lovejoy published a full account of the lynching of an African-American in St. Louis as a subsequent trial that acquitted the mob leaders. The critical report angered some local people. And in July of 1836, his press was destroyed by a white mob. So what he did, what Lovejoy did, is he decided to move across the Mississippi River. And uh, across the Mississippi River is Alton, Illinois. Illinois was a free state. So he figured, okay, I'll be safe over here. It's a free state. Well, all the slave, uh, pro-slavery people had to do was cross the Mississippi River, and they did. And uh, after he started the Alton Observer, another anti-slavery newspaper just across the river, um, they three times his printing press was seized and thrown in the Mississippi River, and, and another time it was set on fire, and uh, Lovejoy was killed. Um, I believe he was shot to death uh, in 1837. So he became a uh, he he became a martyr for the cause.